Trump speaks, Biden stumbles, and YouTube cracks down on Remnant TV. Too bad, but hey, we're in good company. Amazon just canceled one of the most successful black men in America. It's Black History Month, but that doesn't matter to the woke left. Hey, hey, ho, ho, Justice Thomas has to go. Plus, here we go, Christian America. We're looking right into the face of the worst persecution in American history under the Equality Act. But we're still slugging it out over 500-year-old terror stories for children? Do Catholics really worship the Virgin Mary? All that and more tonight from the Editor's Desk. Hello again, ladies and gentlemen. Michael Matt coming to you once again from the offices of the Remnant Newspaper. Well, uh, Donald Trump has addressed the nation one more time today at the CPAC. What would you think? Yeah. Not yeah, bad. Good. Yeah. Hello, CPAC. Do you miss me yet? Do you miss me? Meanwhile, poor old Uncle Joe continues to run what's left of this country into the ground. We're, we're all left to wonder who's really in charge of the country because clearly it's not this guy. And representatives, uh, Shirley Jackson Lee, Al Green, Sylvia Garcia, Lizzie Pinelli, uh, uh, excuse me, Pinell, and uh, what am I doing here? I'm going to lose track here. And uh, uh, yeah, well, that's that's Sheila Jackson Lee, Mr. Uh, President, not Shirley, <laughs> but who's counting? Now, this is exactly what we predicted was going to happen half a year ago. Do you remember this? We see all this insurrection, all this riot, right? 12 o'clock noon, January 20th. If Joe Biden wins, he is going to be the monument to the U.S. presidency that they are going to tear down. That's why they want him in there. Because they can control him and they can just fundamentally reset this country by destroying the presidency itself. Yeah, I know, I know what you think. You think this is all about Kamala Harris, but I actually don't. Really? Well, I'm, yeah, I'm really not sure it's about Kamala. Here's the thing. I think a successful black American, the first black woman uh, president, would be hailed as a great victory for America. And I don't think that anybody in the world community, the global community, is interested at all in America looking good or progressive or anything else. They're trying to tear this country down. I don't think it's about Kamala. This is about... This is about the dissolution of the executive branch, the Constitution, and just about anything else that stands in the way of the globalist agenda to rule the world by committee. That's what they got going here. They just have one powerful committee running the whole show. That's what they want. This is, as we've said so many times, this is not Republican versus, polit versus Democrat politics. Something else is going on, and poor old Joe Biden being trotted out there right now to make a fool of himself. I think is pretty much making that that clear to to everybody. I mean, we got Democrats now talking about trying to strip Biden of his ability to have control, the, be, be the only one who controls the nuclear buttons. I mean, this is <laughs> yeah. There, everyone's pretty sure. I, I mean, I try to be patient, but the folks who just blindly voted for Biden because they hated Donald Trump because they wanted more free stuff. It's getting really tough, really tough to take those people seriously. I mean, I hope they're happy because, yeah, I mean, we got we got hell on earth. We got chaos going on because these folks wanted free stuff. It's just unbelievable what's happened to this country. And again, it's, a lot of that is just our it's our fault. It's because we're all products now of <laughs> of this this uh, disinformation, brainwashing national thing called public school, laughingly called public school. They're just cranking out generations of morons now, and that's all coming home to roost. So, anyway, the crackdown on conservatives, the crackdown on people who are actually thinking independent thoughts, that continues with vigor on social media. I think more and more people are just who cares we got options now we're building options now youtube just took another shot at us hi youtube how you guys doing you watching this one let's we'll see what we got here that's make you pull us pull this one down as well you didn't like one that we did a few months ago uh what was the name of that thing that was called trump's populist party or something what they're doing is they're going through all of our own video our old videos and and they're they're flagging them and everything else so we put this one up months ago they finally stumbled upon it i'm not sure exactly what's wrong with it we'll show a little bit and see if you can figure it out just very briefly another point that i think we need to make moving forward as far as how is christian how christian patriots 
do this work of defending our Constitution, defending our country. I want to point once again to members of law enforcement, and I want to thank them for being here today. God bless you, and Merry Christmas to all of you guys. Thank you for your protection and keeping everybody safe. Yeah, not sure what you know, uh, committee guide, community guidelines we violated there, but we did some, and so YouTube wrote to us saying, we'll throw that up on the screen. Dear Remnant, we wanted to let you know that uh, our team reviewed your content, and we think it violates our spam, deceptive practices, and scams policy, end quote. And the scams policy. The scams policy is a big one. Oh, man, that's tough. Yeah. You know what, uh, YouTube, whatever. You know, by the way, folks, you can watch that video. Don't tell these guys, but you can watch that at remnant-tv.com. Just head over to remnant-tv.com. We have a whole section now, a growing rapidly section called Too Hot for Big Tech. And that video, which they took down from YouTube, is available right there for you to for your for your viewing pleasure. Hey everyone, thanks so much for watching. If you'd like to keep in touch, because we don't know how much longer we'll be on YouTube, please click the link in the description box below and sign up for Michael Matt's e -blast. And now, back to the program. Really, friends, it is an honor to be censored by these people. I don't know what, what makes them tick or what their problem is, but we're to the point now, if you're not getting censored by them, you're probably not saying anything that matters. You know, I get email from them just about every day, strikes here. Not strikes so much, but just pulling videos down and, you know, the usual stuff. So um, it's an honor. We are really in good company right now, especially Amazon just took down Justice Clarence Thomas's documentary. Did you see this? Judge Thomas, you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Please be seated. When I was six, I wandered the streets by myself. You were hungry and didn't know when you'd eat. And in the middle of Black History Month, Amazon cancels one of the most articulate, successful, and powerful black men in U.S. history. Well, if you try to go to Amazon Prime to watch the documentary about Clarence Thomas and his time on the Supreme Court and his nomination, this is what currently pops up on your screen. It says, this video is currently unavailable to watch in your location. I mean, it's just become a joke, you know, and nobody's spared. That's the thing with... Uh, Team Biden now up there. There, obviously, he's a he's a, a Supreme Court justice, a justice of the Supreme Court of the United States, and he's treated like some kind of a hick, you know, running a YouTube channel somewhere, just getting the same sort of you know mistreatment and cancellation as any other slob out there, you know. So that gives us an idea. Not quite the right kind of black guy. But here's a bit of video that I think you know really gets right to the heart of why a man like Justice Thomas can no longer be allowed to speak freely in the land of the free in the home of the brave. And I am decidedly and unapologetically Catholic. It is this faith that has been the guiding beacon during some difficult and seemingly hopeless times. It is not a tether, but rather it is a guide, the way, the truth, and the life. I wish I could just play that whole thing. That that is such a great, great video. That's my old alma mater, by the way. I'm a graduate of Christendom College, and that makes that's a proud moment in the history of, of our college. But those are the core beliefs now. Those are the core beliefs of why they're canceling Justice Thomas. Because they're canceling God. You see, that's the whole point of this. People think that's just a conspiracy theory. We're being paranoid. This would never happen in America. It's happening right now, friends. Just ask Representative W. Gregory Stube, who dared to read the Bible now on the floor of the U.S. Congress this week. Whenever a nation's laws no longer reflect the standards of God, that nation is in rebellion against him and will inevitably bear the consequences. And I think we are seeing the consequences of rejecting God here in our country today. And this bill speaks directly against what is laid out in Scripture. Our government, through this bill, is going to redefine what a woman is and what a man is. And old Jerry Nadler of New York, the congressman from New York, he wasn't having any of it. He was going to put a stop to this right away. Here's what he said. At the end, New York Democratic Representative Gerald Nadler responded. Mr. Stubbe, what any religious tradition ascribes as God's will is no concern of this Congress. God's will 
is no concern of this Congress, is no concern of this Congress. There you go, Jer. You might want to turn your little fat body around and look up over your head there. There's some words that might be of interest to you. Writ large, right over your head. Now, what are we going to do with those? Here's the thing, friends, with the Equality Act now heading right into Senate, you know, it's already passed the House of Representatives. Uh, the cancellation of God, of God's law of biblical truths, this is soon going to become the law of the land. You start quoting the Bible at people, you're going to end up in jail. That's what's happening in this country right now or very soon. And you don't have to be a Catholic to be very concerned by what's happening here. Everybody in this audience right now, go to your telephones and jam up those phones up there and let them know that you are opposed to the Equality Act. This is a devastating blow to religious freedom and to the sanctity of America. If you want to bring the judgment of God on this nation, you just keep this stuff up. I sure hope we can vote our way out of this, but I'm becoming very skeptical. We've just gone too far. And I think it's, it really is time. And you know me. I don't, I'm not a priest. I don't come out here to try to lead you in your spiritual lives or to help you discern peace of soul. That's, that's not my place. I got enough problem with my own peace of soul to tell you the truth. I think I'd come out here and try to advise you on yours. But we really do have to put our big, big boy pants on and realize what has to happen here is this country, this world, has got to turn back to God. Who needs God? Who cares about the church? The life without God, without faith. I've tasted the elixir of that life. I've stared into that abyss. They're literally now, they're literally talking about cutting up your children, brainwashing them, telling them they're little girls when they're little boys, when they're little children, and not asking for your permission or your leave to mess with their heads and to mess with their bodies. And they're doing this in the name of equality, friends. This is satanic. This is perverse. At some point, someone has to get serious here and say, all that matters now is going back to truth, going back to God, going back to the law of God, going back to the Ten Commandments. Does that sound preachy to you? We're just going to keep talking politics forever. I got in a lot of trouble over the past four years because we did a lot of talking politics and supporting politics. But do you know why we did that? Because out of the, in the hope that Donald Trump would wake people up to this reality, that we need to turn back to God. And yeah, we need to turn back to patriotism, the Constitution as well. But we need to turn around here and go back and see what happened to this country. To, to, if there's any hope to ever get out of this, it's just going to keep getting worse and worse and worse. And these pathetic American bishops, they're going to sit here and let the Equality Act come in here, maybe whine a little bit about this. They're, they're going to shut the churches down. They're going to shut your schools down. They're going to arrest Catholics, arrest Christians for preaching the gospel in public, your excellencies. Don't you think it's about time you stop blathering on about immigration and equality and inclusiveness and just talk about bringing this country back to God? When are you going to do that? When are you going to go return to the point and purpose of your job, of your office, of your vocation? Is that ever going to happen? Because we're out here facing actual persecution. While you're dinking around with your little social policies and your fundraisers. And it's ridiculous. This Equality Act thing, you had it coming. You knew it was coming. It was already in the works back in 2019. You did nothing to stop Joe Biden's election. Well, here you go. Hell on earth. Where is your line in the sand? Is there a line in the sand for you that if they cross that, you will finally stand up? You'll finally be what be ready to suffer persecution rather than go along with this because here it comes. And all Americans who claim to be on God's side now, they need to abandon prejudices. They need to abandon this idea that we get to just be you know good little Christians on Sunday morning and the rest of the time. We're just politicians. We're just serious people doing practical things. Well, guess what? Religion is practical. And since we took the practicality of religion out of our society, everything's gone insane. So what about giving that a try for a change, along with our political solutions? Because right now we're still talking about things that 
like I say, 500 year old terrors for children, you know, and I know I, I've said this many times. I think, I think, you know, I'm talking now to our, the Protestant members of this, of this audience, you know how much I appreciate this. You know how important I think it is that we have serious conversations in the world of phony ecumenism. We need to find a way for all Christians, Christian Americans to stand together. But after our last RTV video, short video, the, the Children of Winter, a Protestant, good guy, and I can tell he was a friend of this show, he wrote the following to me. He says, quote, what a powerful and masterfully done warning for our times. Unfortunately and regrettably, I cannot share it with my family and friends due to the ending of the video and my convictions being a Protestant. Could you possibly do another one while leaving off the pleas to marry at the end? I mean, no offense, end quote. And here's the thing, friends. I'm a Catholic. I grew up in the faith. You're a Lutheran. You're, you're a Baptist. You grew up. You were indoctrinated in that. What I'm asking you to, to do, to consider in this brief program tonight, is that we've all sort of got prejudices that we need to at least look at, you know, at least consider. So when, you know, you were told that Catholics worship the Blessed Mother or worship statues, you have to understand it simply isn't true. Uh, when we look at statues, and I let me ask you, when you go to Mount Rushmore and you look at the four presidents up there, are you worshiping them? Are they the graven images that are condemned in Scripture? No, something else is going on. I've traveled all around Europe and in Germany, different parts of Germany, I've found plenty of statues of Martin Luther, and I don't think y'all are worshiping the statues of Martin Luther. You see? See how it works? We need to update our polemic a little bit. Think on our own, you know, beyond the failed leadership that we're all, we're all uh, struggling under to see what's really going on and to see if there's any way without false compromise we can come together and form something of a battle, of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of an army to stand against these people. So now, I mean no offense to my correspondent here, who is, it seems like a heck of a nice guy, and I appreciate the fact that he weighed in on this. But the thing is... Let me clarify. Let me tell you where I'm coming from, and hopefully you can listen to me and we can get, get beyond this somehow. Now, there's a reason. Let me use this, this video that was, came under some criticism. There's a reason the young man in the video, and we'll put that up on the screen here, there's a reason he's walking through the streets of a burned-out city with the rosary in his hand. It's not a decoration. It's not a prop. It's part of the strategic solution <laughs> to what's happening right now. And it has precedent, friends, deep precedent going back a thousand years. This is not just some whimsical invention of ours or some recent popes. We talk so much about the French Revolution and those who resisted the demons in, in 1789, the Vendeans. Well, they carried uh, rosaries as part of their military uniform. They wore a sacred heart just like this as part of their uniform because they knew it was a combination of physical warfare and spiritual warfare. You can't have the one without the other if you want success. 500 years ago, at the Battle of Lepanto, Every warrior, every sailor, every soldier prayed the rosary on the decks of the ships of the Holy League before routing the Ottomans and saving Europe from Islam of that day. Now, these weren't pious people. These probably weren't daily communicants. They certainly didn't just hop off a holy card. They were hardened soldiers of Christendom, right? And they knew, they knew that if there was to be success against evil, you had to have a serious spiritual arsenal of weaponry to do. And the rosary was part of that. One of my, my favorite writers, the late, great Hilaire Belloc, uh, while running for political office now back in the 1930s in England, now he stands before the Jerry Nadlers of his day, on the campaign trail before the election, he was running for office, and here's what he told them when he found out that they were saying he's too Catholic, he could never represent us, he, he's wearing his religion on his sleeve. Here's what Balak said at the time. He said, quote, this is a rosary. As far as possible, I kneel down and tell these beads every day. If you reject me on account of my religion, I shall thank God that he has spared me the indignity of being your representative, <laughs> end quote. Now, that's how a Catholic speaks. And guess what? With that, Hilaire Belloc won his election in a landslide because he didn't try to bury his beliefs for the sake of a tentative unity with non-Catholic friends or for political gain, and neither can we. Now, we can stay brothers on this field. We can brothers in arms on this field of battle. But we cannot bury what we believe. A young student in France boarded a train. He took a seat across from an elderly gentleman who appeared to be dozing. 
When the train lurched, a rosary fell from the gentleman's hand. The young man retrieved it and handed it back to the gentleman. He couldn't resist asking the gentleman if he still believed in such things as praying the rosary. The gentleman admitted that, indeed, he still believed. He then went on to enlighten the elderly gentleman of the more modern and sophisticated view of the world and explained that enlightened people did not believe in such nonsense as praying the rosary. As the older gentleman prepared to leave the train at his stop, the young man offered to send him materials to further enlighten him. The older man kindly accepted the offer and gave the young man his business card as he departed. As the train pulled away, the young man read the card aloud to himself. Louis Pasteur, director of the Institute of Scientific Research, Paris. I would ask you to ask yourself now, let's just see if we can put this one to bed. Let's just put, put an end to this thing about worshiping Mary and ask yourself, why would Jesus Christ, who's God, why would he damn someone to hell for asking his mother's help at a time like this? an apocalyptic moment like this, why would that tick him off? <laughs> Does it make any sense to you? Because it makes none to me. You know, I get it. I know your arguments. You say, you know, no man comes to the Father except through Jesus, which is biblical. I get it, and I accept it completely and do not question it in the least. But God puts all sorts of people in our lives, in his providence. He puts people in our lives who help us come closer to Jesus who alone then ultimately brings us to the Father. Do you see? There's all sorts of things that help us come to the one who brings us to the Father. People, friends, family, and yes, the mother of God. The friends of Jesus 2,000 years ago certainly went to the mother of God for all sorts of reasons, obviously. She was probably cooking for them half the time. I like to think of it in terms like that. They had all sorts of needs that I'm sure she fulfilled perfectly, wonderfully. And they would have gone to her, right? They were human. That's a beautiful thing about Our Lady, the devotion to Our Lady, the humanity of Our Lady. She understood the suffering. She understood what it was like to be human. There's no reason we should dehumanize Christianity by throwing her out. So the friends of Christ would have gone to her many times over the course of the three years of our Lord's public life. Remember what happened at the wedding of, at Cana, for example? Mary has pity. She intercedes, doesn't she? She intercedes for the bridegroom, for the bride, when it's kind of embarrassing that they've run out of wine early in their reception. Why would it be wrong to go to her now? That doesn't make any sense. And think about our own mothers, our actual mothers. These were the first the first teachers about Jesus Christ, they taught us everything we know. They set us on the road of going to Christ for everything, right? They introduced us to him, if you will, so that ultimately he could bring us to the Father. The mother of God is no different than our own mothers. It's the same thing. You go to him. You go to, 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 our, to, our, own, to our real mothers. You go to the mother of God for the same purpose, to bring us closer to her son. Catholics never, ever worshipped Mary. No more than we worship our actual mothers in this world. Idolatry being a mortal sin condemned by the first commandment of God and by every catechism of the Catholic Church. Idolatry is condemned by God and by the Church. <laughs> so please, as, we get, as the hour is late and persecution is coming, read my lips. I do not worship the mother of God and no Catholic ever has in 2,000 years of Catholic history. If you think they have, you have been misinformed. They built magnificent cathedrals to her in her honor, but not Marian temples of worship. You see the difference? I've been to those, to, those, to those cathedrals all across Europe, and not one of them advocates the worship of the Mother of God. If you think otherwise, you have been misinformed. Michelangelo sculpted her. Bellini painted her. And our Christian fathers and mothers drew her images on the walls of their catacombs. Now, why do you think that should be? Here's one. Here's an example. Mary nursing Jesus. This, this image on the wall of the catacomb dates back to the 3rd century when Christianity was illegal in Rome. 
Now, they weren't worshiping this image on the catacomb wall. They used images like these to help them pray and to honor the mother of Jesus. And when I say they, I say I mean the mothers and fathers of all Christians, all those who claim to be Christians. This is what was happening in the early days of the church, of Christianity. This did not develop later on. This picture, this image, dates back to the third century. And why were they doing this? They were doing this because from the cross, 200 years earlier, Christ had given his mother to them, to us, when he said, son, behold thy mother. He did this. Not John, not Mary, not some future weird pope that Martin Luther was, <laughs> was tangling with. Jesus did this, and he did it for a reason. Johan Bar And for us to reject Mary then, after he gave her to us from the cross, is to reject him. Don't you see? You know, all the crusaders of Christendom, the great minds of Christendom, such as St. Thomas Aquinas and St. Augustine, the leaders of Christendom, Clovis, Charlemagne, the heroes of Christendom, Joan of Arc, King Louis IX, they all went to Mary like little children, as children go to their mothers, not as worshipers go to a false goddess. Do you understand this? And when the soldiers, there's such rich and beautiful history to reflect on where this came from. When the soldiers of a pagan world order, when they came to the Garden of Gethsemane and they took Christ into custody, what happened? His disciples ran away. We're in Lent, so we should talk about this and think about these things. Mm -hmm. His disciples ran away from him. His apostles abandoned him. Peter denied him. Judas betrayed him. And John, the beloved apostle, fled in fear. Which means that Jesus left the garden friendless and in chains. But what happens when we turn the page? There's John. There is John, the beloved apostle, standing at the foot of the cross, a tower of fearless strength. <laughs> what do you think might have happened? What happened that changed John from the guy who took off running from the garden to the one who stands beneath the foot of the cross now for all time? Well, it seems pretty clear. John was like a brother to Jesus. And he, of all the apostles, would have known that the master's friends and his family especially were next to be put into chains. He would have remembered Mary, the mother of Jesus, whom Je Jesus loved more than all else. And Jesus did not need to have more to think about or worry about that night as he entered his passion than that they were abusing his mother. So John, naturally, he would have known the soldiers were coming for her and he would have tried to do something about it. So what does he do? He rushes to her home, to the home of Mary, pounds on the door, and he tries to take her to safety. And imagine what she must have said, what she must have looked like, the look that she must have given John in that moment. Mary said, no. You know, her heart is broken. Her, her heart is pierced with Simeon's sword now. It's begun. The passion has begun. And she would go with Jesus all the way to the cross. This is what the, the, the cult of, the, of devotion to the Blessed Mother is based in, friends. That John tried to save Mary, obviously, and Mary took him to the cross. And in that moment, her rescuer, John, becomes the rescued, rescued by the Mother of God. So he walked with her in the bloody steps of our Lord up the hill to the place of the skull. He stood with her. He was not afraid anymore. The fear left him, and for all history, John stands there at the foot of the cross, the only apostle to stay with Jesus all the way to the end. Why? Why John? Because he was the one that went to Mary first. Don't you see, if we dismiss this devotion, if we take Mary out of this, what we're doing to ourselves, it's, it's, it's of the devil to get rid of her at this particular time especially. You know, as a new persecution begins, as the darkness of Calvary falls over us again now, as the bishops flee in terror again, <laughs> we must do what John did. We stand with Mary in the shadow of the cross. 
We ask her to ask her son to protect our families from the Romans, the new Romans. See, John is the only apostle who was not martyred. And why do you suppose that is? John wasn't martyred. Mary Magdalene wasn't martyred. And she too stood with Christ to the bitter end at the side of Our Lady. And I think the reason they weren't martyrs is because when, when Jesus looked down from the cross and saw how much pain and anguish his afflicted mother was in, he also saw them standing with her. And he never forgot that. He stood with them in a very special way because they had stood with her. As I see it, friends, this is a rather terrifying moment. And as I say in every one of these shows, I, 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 don't, I don't think fear means lack of faith. Fear means you, you get it. You understand that we're going to be asked, possibly, to, to make some serious sacrifices now over the next couple, a couple of years even, maybe. But as I see it, they're putting Christ back on the cross today on the cross of human pride and if we're to keep the faith and live to see him rise again as he will surely do then let's do what those who were closest to him 2000 years ago let's do what they did let's stand with mary in the shadow of the cross until the persecution ends and the father calls us all home don't lose hope friends and if you don't share my catholic faith at least share my catholic hope that as this persecution begins all of us together will be given the strength not to abandon the cross, not to flee for fear of the Romans or fear of the wolves, but to do whatever we possibly can to bring Christ back into the chaos that is this new world order. We need to stand together, friends, not judge each other, but stand together and do whatever we possibly can to earn the right to stand at the foot of the cross until this nightmare is over. So my two cents, friends, a happy uh, Lent to you, because we're in the middle of Lent now. God bless you all. I'm Michael Matt from Remnant TV, and we'll see you next week.